Today's scripture is from Colossians 3, verses 1 to 17. Therefore, if you have been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, and not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ, in God. When Christ is our life, <coughs> who is our life, I'm sorry, is revealed, then you also will have revealed, be revealed to him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immortality, impurity, passion, evil, desire, and greed which amounts to idolatry. It is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience, and in them you also once walked when you were living in them. But now you also put them aside, all put all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abuse of speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on a new self who is being renewed in the true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and freeman. But Christ is all and, all and in all. So those of you who have chosen God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also you should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the period bond of unity. Perfect bond, sorry about that. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and to be thankful, and let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns of spiritual and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word and deed, do in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him, to God the Father. Well, this is the fifth of the five things that we're looking at under the general theme of fortitude for the future. As you know, our theme for the season is finding strength, today's strength and tomorrow's help, or tomorrow's hope. And uh, that's what we're uh, talking about. And several weeks ago, I talked about Jesus' prophecies in the book of Matthew regarding the th things that we were going to see in the days ahead. And then I preached the following Sunday from the 12th chapter of Hebrews about the shaking. And as I concluded that, that particular message, I named these five things. And as I thought about it, I thought, you know, we really need to address each of those on an individual level. And so we looked at at several of those, and the last of which we're looking at today is the idea of learning to minister with compassion instead of with callousness. The world has its way of uh, creating calluses on our spiritual hands and our spiritual lives. Our hearts can become so impacted by the things that are going on around us that we let our hearts become hard, and as a result of that, 
we fail to live our lives out in a way that Christ has commanded us to. I didn't know, of course, when we, I made this plan to cover those five individually, I had no idea of what was going to happen in Ukraine and the fallout from that. And yet the thing that keeps coming to my mind is as I've watched the news and of course I get through several social media outlets and then just email in general, I get a lot of information, I get a lot of news reports of different things and I also get a lot of calls and a lot of uh, emails and so on from different people telling me about different things that are going on. And one of the things that has been clear to me is how easy it is for us to mistake other emotions and other feelings for compassion. And as I started preparing for today's sermon, I decided to look at compassion and the definition of it. And, and uh, it occurred to me that a lot of people who think they have compassion don't because there's something different about the word compassion. And I've listed on this particular, uh, this particular uh, study guide, I've listed a number of different words that you can find there that, that represent or that people sometimes misunderstand for compassion. For example, the word pity. Pity is not compassion. You can have pity on somebody and we think that when we pity somebody that we're exercising compassion. Or we can talk about empathy. I empathize with you. Or I, a word that's not quite as strong as the word sympathy. I sympathize with you. We find ourselves saying, oh, I'll pray for you. I know how you feel. Well, you probably don't. You probably don't know how they feel and you probably don't pray for them. <laughs> I, you know, you understand what I'm saying. Because we have a way, and Satan has a way of so dulling us to the needs of people around us that we think that we're concerned when we're really not all that concerned. And that's really tragic. That should never be present in the life of a Christian, and yet it is for many of us. And Joanna, I, I'm not exempt from that. There are times when I hear about so many needs that I become numb to them all, and I don't pay much attention. And I'll tell somebody, yeah, I'll pray for you, and then I end up not praying for them. Or if I do pray, I pray so superficially that it has no real impact. It has no substance to it. And it occurs to me, and the scripture bears it out, that the difference between all of these other words and the word compassion basically is the idea of action. By definition, both in the Merriman-Webster Dictionary and also in the Bible dictionaries that I looked at, the word compassion was always accompanied by some form of action. Sorrow and grief over a situation that were so significant and so intense that it caused me to do something. And I've listed ten different examples of compassion in the New Testament. They're found there in the study guide. And one of the common characteristics of all of those, whether it was the compassion of Jesus or the compassion of somebody else or the compassion of someone in a parable, it was always this. They were so burdened and so concerned over that particular situation or that individual that they took action. We find over and over again, Jesus had compassion when he saw the 5,000. So what did he do? He fed them. And then not long after that, he was again meeting, there were 4,000 people, and it says that he had compassion. So he had compassion, and he fed them. When the two blind men came and saw him, or the lepers came and saw him, he had compassion, and he healed them. When he saw the blind men, he had compassion and restored their sight. When the good Samaritan and the story that Jesus told when he saw the man laying in the ditch after all the religious people had walked by, the Pharisee and the Levi, Levite, they had walked by, but when the Samaritan came by, a man from Samaria, you don't understand, the man from Samaria was known by the, in the minds of the Jews, the, words, the Samarians were half-breeds. 
They came from a stock of, Jew of Jewish heritage that was mixed, and they, they saw them as half-breeds. They saw them as, as being people like lepers who did not deserve, and yet this is the man that came and ministered to the Jewish man that had been robbed and thrown in the ditch. So what does that say to us? I don't, I don't know everything that it says, but one of the things I think it says is it is so easy for us to lose our spiritual sensitivities. It's so easy for us to get so wrapped up and absorbed in our own personal lives that we give little heed to the people who are hurting. Even in this room this morning, I'm sure there are people who are hurting, you're grieving, you're carrying a burden that you don't know if you can stand it through the day. It's so heavy on you and it's breaking your heart. Maybe it's the salvation of someone you know, or maybe it's somebody who's dying and, and you don't know what to do. And yet, the rest of us either don't know what you're going through or we know what you're going through, but we don't really care enough to come and do something to help you carry the burden. The thing that the disciples in Jesus' day were known for was two things. If you go to the book of Acts, you find that one of the things that they constantly said about the new believers in Jerusalem, they said, my, wow, how they love each other. That was a strange thing for them because that wasn't the culture. The people who were not followers of Christ, they didn't love each other in the same way that the Christians loved each other. They weren't willing to give up their coats. Jesus talks about this. If you want to know a, a good picture, and I didn't list this, but if you want to see a good picture of what compassion looks like, go read the, the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus said this. He said, if somebody abuses you, Love them. If somebody says something against you, pray for them. And then he gave the illustration. He said, if somebody comes by and asks for your outer coat, not only give them the outer coat, but give them your suit jacket too. And he talked about, if you really are, are following me, then if somebody comes along, and he's carrying a pot on top of his head because he's got coals in that, in that pot to go start a fire down the road as he travels. He said, go ahead and heap some more coals on top of that. Now, some of you think it didn't mean that, but that's, that was the, his, the, the traditional practice when people would carry fire along with them in order to be able to build a campfire while they were traveling down the road. It, easy. It was easy for those coals to burn out, go cold. And he said, you see somebody like that, don't do that. Add some more coals to it from your fire so that when, when you get there or when they get there, they've got something to keep them warm and something by which to cook their meals before they travel on their journey. And so you see, the life of compassion is a common characteristic of what it means to be a follower of Christ. And I have to be honestly to tell, honest to tell you this morning that this is such an overwhelming thought for me that I knew from the get-go that I wasn't going to be able to come close to following the study guide, so that's for you to study on your own. But I do want us to think about how, well, first of all, compassion. Compassion is a part of God's nature. One of the words that I didn't mention, the word compassion appears 98 times, I think it is, in the Bible. About the same number in the Old Testament as in the New Testament. And the definitions there are very, very clear. It is such an empathy, such a burden, such a concern and a caring for another person or for another situation that, that it leads you and drives you to take some sort of action. You see, you can have... A, an elderly widow living right next to you and you know that she doesn't have the strength and the energy to go out and cut the wood, chop the wood that she needs in order to heat her house in Kharkiv, Ukraine or some other place like that. And, and so you say, well, I'm so sorry for the, that lady. I think I will pray for her. That's not compassion. 
But if you pick up the axe and go over and chop that wood because you care, care about her welfare, that's another story. One of the men that I mentioned a little bit ago, Paul Logan, he has a ministry called Arise Ukraine. You can go on the website and find his. That's one of the places you could go to give money if you wanted to give. Several years ago, after the 2014 attack by Russia on the east on eastern uh, Ukraine, and and when they annexed and took Crimea and then two of the provinces or the states and the eastern Ukraine, Paul got the burden for the men and women, particularly the elderly, that didn't have any way to leave under the fighting. Their houses were bombed and their houses were destroyed. Many of them were burned. Many of them were living in the cold, and I mean cold, with no windows and no doors because they'd been blown out. And Paul tried to figure out a way that he could help, and he knew that the need was so massive he couldn't help everybody, but he could help some. And so he sent the word out to many of us who hear from him and said, we're trying to, gain, trying to raise money to provide coal and wood for the people to heat their homes and to cook on. Because in most of those houses back over there in the older homes, you have a, a wood burning or a coal burning stove with a top like a Klondike stove, so to speak. And it sits out in a little side room just outside the kitchen. And they try to heat the whole house from that one little stove, and it's flat, so they do all their cooking on it. And so he decided he wanted to do that. And today, because of the generosity of a lot of people, uh, he was able to provide heating fuel for several hundred families in that area. And he does it through he, uh, local churches. He works with the local congregations of people, and he said, you know people in your neighborhood who, who need this so desperately. Well, that was an expression of compassion. So what do you and I do? How, first of all, can you and I develop a compassionate heart? Because it's awfully easy to become calloused and uncaring, isn't it? I mean, you come, like I've said already, you, you cut to a point where you see so much of this stuff on the news that your, your mind just clicks off and you don't, you listen but you don't hear and you just go on your way and you say, oh, those poor people. You know, when you think, you know, I just, I don't know, have you taken time to think about what you would be going through if you were in Ukraine today? What if you were down in the metro station or down in the catacombs. People don't realize that the city of Ukraine during the Second World War, that the city of Ukraine developed a tunnel system that literally honeycombs the hills on which the West Bank is, uh, is built. Actually, yeah, it's, it's the West Bank, what well, they call it the right bank. And underneath on those hilltops where all the monasteries and all of the churches and the business, businesses are located. That entire hillside, that whole area of all those hills are, is honeycombed with tunnels and caves and, and of course their subway system. They have about six or seven subway lines that go through the city. And people are hunkered down in there. I saw a, I saw a picture last night of a young mother and her little baby and she was being interviewed by one of the news people and she was describing what it's like to be down there. And there have been, some people have been down in there for several weeks as they were anticipating what was going to come. And so you've got leaky pipes up above you and the concrete floor is damp and it's stale and musty in there and you're staying there for all that period of time. During the Second World War there was a a Jewish community in western Ukraine that when the German forces came through to to try to basically eliminate, annihilate the Jewish people. And there was a little cluster of people from a community that found a cave. And I don't know if you've ever read the story and I don't remember the title of the story now, but it's also a video that, I, that we've watched 
they lived in those caves for over three years. And they would only come out, and they would send a young man out in the nighttime to find food. And, and on one of those episodes, uh, one of the young men went out to find food, and they ran into one of his neighbors and asked the neighbor if he could be of some help. And the neighbor gave him some food and then turned around the next day and reported to the German army where they were. So how do you live like that? Joanne and I were in, been in Bosnia many, many times before we did our ministry in Ukraine, and I still remember the first, son, the first trip that we took to Sarajevo. And a young man who was a missionary took us up on a plateau overlooking the city. Bosnia, is sur or, uh, Sarajevo is surrounded by mountains. It's in a big bowl. There's a river that runs through it, and there's complete surrounding of mountains on all four sides. And he took us up on this spot and he said, this is one of the locations where the Serb, Ar Serb army positioned one of their mortar and, and uh, rocket launching uh, brigades or, or units. And they sat there and bombarded Sarajevo for four years. 95% of the buildings in the city of Sarajevo were either destroyed or damaged. And the people were there and these guys would said and they would look at a particular apartment building that was still standing, maybe it was 12 or 14 stories high, and they'd target that one, and they'd start shooting away until it was, until it was nothing but rubble. They did that with the newspaper, newspaper office, uh, with the idea that they could stop the newsprint. Well, they moved all their printing presses to the basement, and Joanne and I have been by that place many, many times. It's now a national monument in, this, in the country because the building never completely collapsed, but it's still rubble that's two or three stories high. And that newspaper went down, and they stayed with the stuff, and they continued to print the news so that the people could be there. We went over to the other side of the airport, and while we were over there, we saw all of these houses, row after row after row, as far as the eye could see. And the sides of the, the apartment buildings were blown out. And people who were living there today, they had no other place to live, and they were living there, and all they, did, they could do was to hang blankets up across a big opening that was a gaping hole. If you were to walk out past that, you'd fall two or three stories down to the ground below, because there was no window, no wall, nothing. And we went to the other side, the other side of the airport, and we were so stunned to discover that during that time, the people were so adamant that they were not going to be defeated that they built a tunnel under the airport. I think it's something, I want to say it, either two miles or four miles long, a tunnel that's about four feet high. And they had that tunnel that went from a, from a house, one house in the suburban area on the other side of the airport, and tunneled all the way through to one of the buildings in downtown city. And the people would go through that tunnel back and forth in order to get food out here to be able to take food back into the, into the town. And the general, the commanding officer of the military, would go back and forth in order to give his troops that were hiding out in the city and trying to fight back. I mean, the lack of compassion does strange things to people. And this is the kind of ministry and the kind of heart that God wants you and me to have. So how do we do that? How do we, how do we let the callousness scale off and fall by the wayside? How do we get rid of those spiritual calluses that come from the dailiness of life and, and the hardships that we face and the challenges? And I've just tried to make some suggestions there under a couple different points, but one of them is found in the very beginning of the passage that we looked at in Colossians 3. Keep seeking the things above. Get your eyes focused again on the Lord. Seek things from above. And then he goes on and he says, keep thinking about those things above and keep remembering in verse 3, your life as a Christian is hidden with Christ. And he says, and when Christ, 
who is our life, appears. We need to be ready for that. And so that shows me the four things that will help us get rid of the scales. Keep thinking, keep seeking things above. Be able to pray like Jesus taught his disciples, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it has been done in heaven. You see what I'm getting at? Somehow, and, and those of us who are in this room today, we're all seniors. Some of you don't want to admit that, but it's true. <clears throat> have you ever thought about the wealth of spiritual maturity and resources that you have available to pass on to the younger generation? When they look at you, and you can tell them your experiences just like I have been sharing some of our experiences with you. Joanne and I were married 63 years ago last month. And the journey has been absolutely astounding. We look back at it, and you've heard me say this before, we just stand around with our mouths open. We, I was born on a farm in southern Illinois, and Joanne was born under a cactus in Tucson. <laughs> Actually, she was born in a hospital. I was born in a farmhouse. And the doctor that came to deliver me had to come in on horseback because there was too much snow on the ground. And when he got there, I was a breech birth, and he was drunk. He, and he, I was blue as the sky, and he pronounced me dead. <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> but I look at that and I think, you know, and even before that, when, when my father was just two years old, their farmhouse burned. And my grandfather went in for a last final look around before the roof would collapse. And he wanted to see if there was anything else he could bring out. And he found my dad asleep on one of the beds. And he brought him out. Well, your life may be different and may not be the same. And you may not have some of the experiences. And your, the, your journey has not taken you in the same way that ours has taken us. But the fact still remains that there's a reason you're here. The reason that you haven't gone on to heaven yet. And God has given you memories and experiences of his faithfulness that you can pass on and you need to pass on. You need to learn to build each other up. You need to learn to, to let your children and your grandchildren in on some of the stories that maybe you've not told them about. And so I just encourage you, keep seeking. Because what did Jesus say in Matthew? He said, seek and you'll find. Keep seeking the things above. Keep thinking about that. Let that be your focus. Don't, be, don't let your sickness or, 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 or the new carpet that you need to buy or, or, or the, whatever it is, don't let that stuff be the center of your attention. They can be a part of your life, but don't let that be your focus. Your focus needs to be on spiritual things. This is why Paul made this comment. He says, whatever is true, whatever is honest, whatever is just, whatever is a good report, let your mind think on that stuff, you see. I, I wonder about the people in Ukraine right now who have no hope and no faith in Christ. You can tell the difference just by l listening to what they say. You know whether they're trusting God or if they're looking at circumstances and trusting in man and trying to figure things out. It's all the difference in the world. You can see it in the, what they say. You can see it in the way they look. Because when you set your heart on things above, it makes all the difference in how you deal with the things below. See. Part of the thing that's necessary then in preparing your heart to be a heart of compassion is to understand what the crucified life is all about. I call it the crucified life for sake of simplicity. Paul makes this comment. He said, I've been crucified with Christ. I shared this a few weeks ago. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in this flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You need to learn how to live dead. 
Paul made this comment. He said that the, 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 when Christ went to the cross, he said the world was crucified to me and I was crucified to the world. In other words, the world and everything that it holds means nothing to me anymore. Paul made this statement. He says, to me, to live, it's Christ. See, I don't think it's possible for us to have the kind of compassion that we need to minister to people unless Christ is all and in all in our lives. Because if we don't allow that to happen and allow Christ to, to bring to our, our old carnal nature, everything that hints of the world and hints of the flesh, if we don't allow him to bring the cross against that, we'll always be living a mixed life, a merging life, a, a syncretic life where you take something from here and something here and try to merge it and make it work. And then we need to remember God's wrath. We have a tendency to uh, forget that. Paul said in the second chapter of Romans that the wrath of God is exerted against all ungodliness. See? And so we need to be willing to allow the Lord to exercise his justice and his judgment and his wrath in our lives to where he jerks out of our lives everything that is displeasing to him. Are you willing to let him do that? Or would you be willing to let him say, Lord, do surgery on me. I'm laying out on the table and you pull out of my life anything and everything that doesn't please you. It's when we go through those experiences, we really get to where we understand what compassion is. Otherwise, all we're doing is feeling sorry for people, having pity on people. Even empathizing with them, being able to, and the word empathy is a good word. I'm not saying these things are wrong. All I'm saying is that they're not the same thing as compassion. And we need to stop fooling ourselves. And we need to allow God to take the scales off of our eyes and we begin to look at where other people are, maybe even right next door to you. And we need to be able to hear what other people are saying. If you go with the sixth chapter of Isaiah and read the story of Isaiah, you'll realize that it talks about when he, he says, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, and he goes on and describes that. But it wasn't until God touched Isaiah's lips and touched his heart that then God said, okay, now who can I send and who will go? And it was only after Isaiah had had his own life uprooted and dra dramatically changed in the temple that he was able to say, I will, I'll, I'll go. And then God tested him out by saying, now you're going to go and you're going to say things that people won't listen to and you're going to do things that people won't understand. And he said, they're going to have bl blind eyes and deaf ears, but you keep doing it. Keep doing it. Well, on the back page at the very end I've listed just 10 things that are ideas that you can look at that you can do in order to become a more compassionate than you are. Be alert to things and people that need your compassion. Thank God for the opportunity he's given you to do that, to see that. Pay attention to other people around you. Don't walk by them so quickly. Try to see things through the eyes of the people that are suffering. Don't just say, I know what, how you feel. First of all, because you probably don't. How, how can a person who just lost a loved one, how can, how can you feel the same way that person feels? You may have a similar experience, but how can you do that? You can. Yeah, see. The easiest way I know is to be a person of compassion 
is, first of all, to be a person of prayer and intercession. Secondly, is to be a person who is willing to give, be a person who's willing to serve, be a person who is willing to send, send money, send whatever, send a card, send a pie, and then be a person who's willing to do the ultimate, and that is willing to go. There's an old song that we used to sing that's one of my favorites. We're going to sing the chorus to it in a little bit, but I want to read the words to you. This was written by a man, Ira Nelson, Wilson, back in about 1905, 1906, somewhere back there. In fact, when he was nearing his death, he, he didn't live very long. He died, I think, in 1950. And uh, he was 70 years old. I think he was born in about 1880 and lived to 1950. And, in his older years, he, he couldn't even remember that he wrote this song. Here's what the words say. Out in the highways and byways of life, many are weary and sad. Carry the sunshine where darkness is rife and make the sorrowing glad. Tell the sweet story of Christ and his love. Tell of his power to forgive. Others will trust him if only you prove true every moment that you live. Give as was given to you in your need. Love as the master loved you. Be to the helpless a helper indeed. Under your mission be true. And the refrain says, make me a blessing. Make me a blessing out of my life. May Jesus shine. Make me a blessing, O oh Savior, I pray. Make me a blessing to someone today. Any of you know that song? Several of you do. We used to sing it all the time. Now it's hard to find the music. Very few hymnals have it. But it's a powerful song. And we're going to conclude the service this morning after I pray with the chorus of that. But all I want to do is encourage you. Ask God to give you a heart of compassion. And if you're willing to ask him to do that, he will. Don't ask him, say, Lord, don't let me just sell, settle for being, having pity on people. Don't let me settle for just having sympathy or even empathy with people. Turn me into a person of compassion because that's the very nature and character of Jesus. Everywhere you go throughout the Gospels, you find Jesus over and over again. It says he saw this and he was filled with compassion. And again, compassion is being grieved and sorry over something that is going on so intensely that you are willing to take action and to do something about it. And it was to give to the poor or go work in a soup kitchen someplace or give some of your things away or whatever the case may be. And I know that many of you are probably wanting to find a way to do something with the people that are suffering in Ukraine. And I'll try to provide some suggestions to that later. But whatever it is, don't allow the enemy to steal from you the privilege and the honor and the joy of being a person of compassion. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, I don't know, uh, I haven't covered nearly everything. I don't know if what I've said has made sense. But whatever else you can get out of this, I ask that you will cause us to be people who really truly do care. And we care enough that it doesn't matter what it costs us or how inconvenient it may be to us. Because we need to be a, a person and we need to be people who will be a blessing to other people. In however way that plays itself out and in whatever way it happens and however you lead us, 
Just like the song that the lady sang, I surrender all, all to Jesus, I surrender. I surrender all. Continue guiding us through this day, and I pray that our hearts will be strengthened and encouraged, and that we will, among whatever else we do, become people who will pray for the amazing people living in Ukraine. As we sing, I pray that this will not only be a song we sing, but it will be a prayer that we say. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen.